I was out on the plant floor and he came up to me and said, hey, I want to build this emergency uh, shelter home. I think we can make one out of a grain bin. I go, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests, thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. And listeners, welcome back to the Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Winterhoff. This is Corey Hillebo. And this is David Whitaker. We are getting ready to set you up for another fantastic profit episode. But before we get there, we got to cover some announcements. So how can they find us, Corey? You can find us at Farm, the number four profit, at any of our social medias, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You know, Facebook, you guys are a little slow on. Like, let's, uh, <laughs> let's bump our Facebook up a little bit. I know it's probably not the social of choice these days, but come on. And uh, farm, the number four profit, LLC at gmail.com. Send us uh, guest suggestions, any reviews, things like that. Also review us at Spotify now yeah. and iTunes. Yes, and that, that's really important to us. We appreciate that uh, a lot. But for listeners, if you're joining us for the first time or just catching on, we have two different show structures. That's why we are affectionately referred to as the Mullet of Agriculture podcast. we got the business on the episode in front called Farm for Profit with the What's Working in Ag segment and a general topic to help your farm achieve higher levels of profitability. And then we let our hair down, have some coffee shop type talk in our mm -hmm. Farm for Fun shows over a couple of drinks and get to meet some really cool people. So yeah. this is the profit show this week, next week, or the week before will be a fun show. We got a lot of good reviews. Dave, who's our reviews brought to you by? This week, they're going to be brought to you by BW Fusion. Of course, they have what I refer to as bugs in the jug, but it is all the microbiologicals that you need to put in your field to bring the edge of the field, the fence row, back to the center is what we're talking about. And that's Brody and Bodie. Uh, they've been great partners with us uh, all through the podcast. Absolutely. That They are partnering that with that 365 soil and tissue program. So not only can you just put it out there in the field, but you can monitor whether or not it's actually working for you. That, in that's my favorite part about it. Real time. Corey Zimmerman left us this review. I enjoy listening to your guys' podcast while I work. So thank you, Corey Zimmerman, for leaving us that review. We appreciate any and all reviews that we get. But I'm excited. The National Farm Machinery Show was a lot of fun. We collected a lot of content, and we're going to do our best to put it out in an entertaining fashion for you. We have a repeat guest, Corey. We've had Kelly Garrett on before, haven't we? Yeah, Mr. Chasing Francis himself. It's been a long <laughs> <laughs> Long time. Kelly, how you doing? Good. How are you guys today? We're great. We're having a good time. Why don't you remind our listeners who you are and what you do? I'm Kelly Garrett. I farm in western Iowa, uh, here by just nine miles west of Denison. Uh, my dad and I farm about 7,000 acres. We've got a cow-calf herd. We've got a trucking business. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Extreme Ag Farm website. Um, I'm one of the first farmers in the nation, I guess, or if, if I have the, I have the notoriety of being the first farmer in the nation to sell my carbon credits. I'm currently working with the True Terra Carbon Market and Nori, and I'm excited to to be part of that program as well. Awesome! So this is our what's working in ag segment. So we're curious. Obviously, uh, you have done quite a bit, and and like you said, are leading a lot of agricultural forces forward. So what's working for you on your farm this spring? My focus this spring, uh, you know, putting this, the 22 crop in is stress mitigation. We had a couple trials. Uh, one was from Agrison, is a new experimental product. Uh, another one was uh, a product that we worked with with Lee Lubers called, you know, we call it Shield. I, you know, to explain this, I would tell you that the current yields I'm getting I think I have more than enough fertility. And I think our focus is always on more fertility all the time. And what I learned from these trials this year is I really don't know what a stress-free crop looks like, and I don't know what a healthy crop looks like. And the reason I don't know is because I've not seen one. Another trial we had, I forgot, was Zyway. 
you know, Zyway has gotten his uh, fungicide from FMC that was supposed to go in furrow. There was a few problems in the southern United States putting it in furrow. So, and you know, Matt and Kevin, my extreme egg partners, they had a they had a few problems. So because of that, I put Zyway in the two by two. Had a twenty six point seven bushel yield increase. Whoa. So that's trying. That's that's keeping that crop healthier. The stress mitigation product from Agrison. You know, I'm like, I, you know, I this is this snake oil? What is it? You know, in a stressed area, I had a 28 bushel yield increase from the stress mitigation product. Wow. In June, when the corn was rolled up tight because it was hot and dry and the wind was blowing, we walked out there with the Agerson, uh, the Agerson people, the executives, the agronomist, and you walked across that field. The corn's rolled up. You got out to the trial area, and the corn was unrolled like it was a nice day. We took note of it that at that point just because of the visual effects. And I'm like, I got to pay attention to this. And I was excited about it. 28 bushel. So again, I don't know what a healthy stress-free crop looks like because I've never seen one. My focus on the next year is, you know, I, I don't mean I'm going to go backwards on fertility, but we have got to take the stress off the crop. And I believe that's the key to the next spot, to the next yield barrier. There you have it. You got to get the stress off the crop. So Kelly Garrett grows more bushels than anybody but you gotta you gotta move those bushels <laughs> so a few weeks ago we were down in down in louisville with uh brant doing some stuff for them and we heard that you might have a couple brant products is that the case we did last fall we purchased two new brant products one is a 13 110 open top auger and then what the open top part means there's no uh there's no swing auger on it for the semi to dump in so then the, uh, it's called a grain deck, and it's an independent piece. You know, so you do have to move two pieces down the road when you go, but this grain deck dumps into the open top auger, and the grain deck is a belt. So when the semis pull up, they just drive over top of it, and it's like a dump, a drive over pit. And it's so much better than that swing hopper that I've been used to the rest of my 25 years of farming. Uh, the grain deck deal is great. It runs off the hydraulics of the tractor that are running the auger, you could empty a truck in about 12 minutes. I mean, it, it was great. We, uh, it was a big improvement over what we had. The other product that we bought was a 1535. Uh, so it's a 35 foot, uh, it's a conveyor. You know, we used to have a truck auger, you know, the, with the flighting and stuff. It was noisy. It, it was hard on the grain quality. You know, it was chain driven, things like that. And uh, this belt conveyor, you know, we've been hauling corn out of this bin now. It runs quiet. Uh, the grain quality is better. It doesn't crack it, anything like that. Uh, I'm really happy with both of my brand products. My dad was just hauling corn to town, big money corn, and Getting couldn't, rich. couldn't get started because the, the belts had been chewed off by the squirrels on the old <laughs> auger that he's got. So I told him he needs to get himself a conveyor that'll run just like Kelly said, something smooth, reliable, so and we'll the get the job can done. chew the belt? That's right, the big belt. <laughs> you got anti squirrel. I'm I'm sure Brant has anti squirrel spray. Oh, must. I know all the you know all the seed. We grow a lot of seed beans, and they all want you to go to the belts because mm -hmm. if you exactly. don't, they they want they want to bring a grain back in, and that costs you you know ten fifteen cents every bushel every time. So, yeah, you're making money just to bring a belt in. So, um, what else do you need to know that the seed company wants you to run that? You know, yeah, it's true. Yep. I mean, the proof is right there. Yeah. So I want to go back back up just a little bit. Maybe I'm the dumb one here. What how do you mitigate stress <laughs> on a plant? I mean, you can't you can't control the weather. We we can't control the environment, the heat, the rain. I mean, we could if we irrigated. What what it, what is this product or not not product, but what are you doing? How do you uh, anticipate mitigating stress on a on a plant? So the Agrison product, uh, one of the products is Accomplish Max. Uh, they have another product called Extract, uh, Maritime. But the Accomplish Max product, they, they talk about metabolites. Some of this goes over my head, to be honest with you. But they talk about metabolites. And Steve Sexton and Brian Cornelius are two agronomists with Agerson that I've got to be close with. They're great guys. And what they explained to me is they have a new way to extract the kelp, the good parts of the kelp out of seaweed. Okay. And I mean, this is in layman's terms. Okay. Yeah. But if you think about, if you think about seaweed and the environment it has to live in, when the tide goes out, it's very hot and very dry. And when the tide comes in, it's very cold, it's very wet, and it's very salty. 
but yet seaweed will grow like a foot a day. It's the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing plants on the face of the earth. And so it has evolved over time to be able to mitigate the stress from the very harsh environments that it that has to live in. So when they they take those properties out of the seaweed, out of the kelp, and I don't know how they do it. And all I know is they use a word called metabolites. And we put that in furrow, and then we made another uh, we made another pass over top, you know, uh, early on. And you know, fast forward to harvest. There's 28 bushel, and that's what I notice. We might have to do a sub podcast on this. This is crazy. I never heard of such a thing. <laughs> Did you guys know there's kelp? Hey. Well, nobody cares, but listen, did you guys know, <laughs> Justin, um, that there's kelp and, and uh, or not kelp, but seaweed and chocolate milk? What? I did no, not, I did not know that. There is. It keeps it keeps the chocolate constant throughout that. Like if you made a Hershey's milkshake, yeah, you know, chocolate milk, shaking. all that chocolate would go to the bottom. The seaweed in the milk actually keeps it looking all chocolate. So you're saying if I put my Hershey syrup into the milk and add some seaweed, once I stir it up, I'm good to go. Ding dong. From Agerson, get some metabolites. <laughs> metabolites. Yeah. Metabolites in the chocolate milk, absolutely. And that's what's working um, in egg, folks. <laughs> the, the other product that we've identified, and this is because of my extreme egg partner, Lee Lubers, we call it Shield. Uh, it has, it's a salicylic acid. You know, it, it's really useful. It's a fertilizer. It's got just a little bit of nitrogen in it. But the part I get excited about is the salicylic acid part of it. And what Lee has taught me, and I, I, this is what I'll tell you about Lee Lubers. He's playing chess and I'm playing checkers. That's how much smarter he is than I am. That's how I learned so much from him. Salicylic acid strengthens cell walls and mitigates stress, whether or not it's cold or heat stress. You want to strengthen the cell walls so they can withstand that. You know, now Lee wants to raise 120 bushel wheat all the time. But 20 years ago, he was raising 45 bushel wheat. That at least was acceptable. Um, he said, you know, wheat, wheat crop comes out, we're going to have a late freeze. And we didn't know what to do. And we sprayed shield on this, on this crop, on this wheat crop. Okay. We didn't know what was going to happen. It looked like it helped it survive. Fast forward to harvest. Lee said, we pulled in and we combined 45 bushel wheat. Our neighbors pulled in. They did not use the salicylic acid. It's a product outside the box. A lot of people thought it was snake oil. They pulled in. They tried to combine. They pulled it back out. The frost had killed it, and the wheat wasn't worth wasn't worth wow. harvesting. You know, you might not need a product like Shield every year. Maybe it's a stress for a year. You know, that doesn't happen very often, but maybe it's a stress for a year, and you don't need it. Um, Lee talks about spraying Shield when uh, when it's early on when it's cold. If you're going to get a late frost, late freeze, he talks about spraying it when it's very hot. You know, well, it's got like a three week residual. I'm going to tell you when I put my uh, the summer. I think we're going to have. When we're going to put our post chem out there, I'm going to have shield on, on every acre because I believe it's going to be hot and dry. You know, you're going to be spraying that that post chem past what? You know, June 5th, June 10th, and that's going to give us three weeks of uh, of help. You know, I, I don't know that it will solve every problem, but I think it's like four dollars an acre. And with the you know with the crop prices we're looking at right now, why would you not try to harvest every bushel you can? Yeah, especially uh, when we're going, wheat prices we're, are where they're at. If you're talking ooh, specifically just on, on the wheat side. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. I, uh, I have put a target gate date for my, for my guys here on the farm. I want to plant beans March 21st. And, ooh. you know, like a few years ago, I planted beans December 6th. Well, that, you know, we're just trying to get lucky and see what would happen. But we're going to plant beans March 21st. There will be accomplished max and furrow. And if and when a frost is approaching and we have a, uh, we have a forecast like that. We'll be putting shield out ahead of time. And I, I'm confident that we can pull this off now because I've got products that I can use to battle against Mother Nature. I've got a plan. So, Kelly, if people want to follow this ambitious goal of getting beans out early and what you're doing to try and continue to push those yield boundaries, how do they follow you? Extremeag.farm. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, as always. Right, Corey? Absolutely. We thank you for joining us on this What's Working in Ag segment. We can't wait until we do it again. Thanks again, Kelly. Anytime, guys. Call anytime. They're minimizing risks on your farm. Helping you improve your yields and increasing your profit margins. In today's farming operations, the data is the key to achieving all of this, Dave. It's no secret that data has been helping more and more farmers gain ground in their operation. And there's no better way to manage all of that data than through John Deere's Operation Center. 
As a leading farm management platform, John Deere is constantly and continuously fine-tuning the features in Operations Center to make it easier, faster for you to analyze all of that farm data. Yeah, and within that Operations Center, you can collect and analyze all of your machine, field, and crop data year after year so you can make those data-driven decisions for your operation. You can set up field instructions for your machine operators, then push those instructions directly to that in-cab display straight from that operations center. Then your operators don't have to enter this information when they get to the field. That is so cool. And with near real-time monitoring with the operations center, you can track the machine performance, the field work, and stay ahead of all the logistics to ensure the right work is being done at the right time. With all that yield data in operations center, you can analyze your farm, your total farm operations performance and make any changes for an even better next year. And John Deere continues to make their operations centers your go-to place to gain ground in your operation. It's free to use. Just create an account at operationscenter.deer.com or download the mobile apps from the Apple app or Google Play stores. You can also see your local John Deere dealer for more information. Thank you to John Deere for being a proud partner of the Farm for Profit podcast. We are down at the National Farm Machinery Show here in February of 2022 in the beautiful Sukup Manufacturing booth where we've been very blessed to be hosted this week. So a lot of traffic. It's good to see people walking around, enjoying the show. And uh, I'm excited, Dave, for I, our guest today. I, I am too. I, the, the, the man himself, the, the legend, Mr. Steve Sukup is with us today. Welcome, Steve. How are you doing? Great. It's great to be back to the farm show. You know, we took that... Uh, year off but uh, boy i think everybody was uh, anxious yeah. to get back and get rolling again absolutely so we know who you are but there might be someone out there that doesn't so would you mind telling us just a little bit about yourself maybe give us a background what you got going on well i've enjoyed the manufacturing all the years industrial engineering from iowa state so enjoyed going down there but uh, grew up in the family business uh, dad started back in uh, 1963 mm -hmm. and uh, part of my story is that i could uh, weld and run a torch when i was in uh, sixth grade and so I always like the fabrication or being able to see something that you've uh, uh, done with uh, everything. And uh, along with that, uh, we farmed. And so uh, I'm up to 50 years of climbing a grain bin. So still, uh, still uh, <laughs> checking that one off the, the, off the list here. That's good cardio. Uh, good cardio, good cardio. And uh, although now I am cheating with the stairs. The stairs uh, it yeah, still counts. Yeah, yeah, but it was, and that's just one of the amazing things, you know, 15 years ago when stairs really became a little bit popular, everybody was saying, oh, that's too expensive. And boy, now even they said, well, dad and grandpa both say, yeah, we got to uh -huh, get the stairs. We gotta get the, stairs. <laughs> <laughs> the decision makers, who is it? Yeah. Who's got that? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, our booth here has changed a little bit over the uh, uh, years with things. Uh, before we always had just a, a stirring machine and a grain bin floor and some fans and heaters. And, uh, and that's one of the stories is uh, since 2000, we've grown 10 times larger wow and it's all been with adding different product lines it hasn't been doing the same thing faster and better it's like adding the grain dryers and having the most grain dryers in the industry that uh, customers can come in and really get focused on which one's the best one that fits their needs right along with the grain bins uh, when we got got into the grain bins of really uh, pushing that along uh, it was one of those things that one of the companies here uh, was our largest customer, but also our largest competitor. <laughs> okay, ah. yeah. And that doesn't, that's not going to last long. And uh, so uh, uh, we made the decision. I went down to one of the manufacturing companies that makes roll formers. And so we started uh, started uh, getting into the bin business and uh, haven't looked back since. Yeah. Oh, very good. We've got the opportunity to interview uh, uh, Gary and John and, and others. And uh, boy, you talk about the diversity of the company from just where it was grain bins or stirators now to uh, different types of drying systems. Uh, we were kind of amazed just looking at all the different products you have in the show booth here. <laughs> and so that took you 10x. That took you forward so uh, so much as a company. Um, was, was that your brainchild or Where'd, where'd that all come from? Was it just uh, good direction and good advice or just good luck? Well, uh, you, you never pass up on good luck. So, and, uh, <laughs> and timing, uh, ti there's never perfect timing either. So that's that's the other thing, you know, you know is there perfect timing? No, uh, with the uh, grain dryers, uh, uh, my dad loved this uh, four-way system that was at the bottom of a grain bin. Okay, yep. it, it'd take out 100 to 300 bushels an hour. And if one of those augers broke, it was a nightmare and everything. And our customers were starting to 
by the, you know, they went from the six row, eight row, 12 row combines and, oh, I'll get a second combine because I really want to get done with harvest. And right. so the end bin drying just wasn't it's very efficient, but it was not going to catch up or keep up with them. And so actually uh, John Hannig, who he had on earlier, John and I went around and looked at the different dryer companies. And it was one of those that you go, you know, these dryers have been around for a long time, but there's got to be something different about the dryers that we could do. Yeah. And, uh, set ourselves apart yeah and so uh john visiting and uh, came up with the quad metering rolls because it's really amazing in drying which you know we we get pretty focused on but even in a dryer with a 12 inch uh, column width the inside grain closest to the fan and heater and the outside grain there's a difference in moisture content yeah, we did. and uh, temperature we had learned about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tanner he talked about uh, running a, a torch and welding and whatnot you know i think all farmers they see an issue. They see a problem. They just, just what he was talking about. Hey, what is a better way we can get this done? I think everybody at the National Farm Machinery Show is thinking that as they bring their product here is, is there's a problem. I see it. I want to fix it. Let's make it better and it breeds new invention. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's how it works. So very good. Yeah, I would agree. So I'm still extremely honored to have you on as a guest because Corey, We've had a lot of fun with the guests that we've had in the three years that we've done this, but we've never had a guest that has his own Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> and our listeners know that, that I like doing research. I like doing the homework to try and get, get some perspective on the yeah. guests before we get into it. And that, that was fun to discover. It's like, ah, this is, this is a real interview. This is going to be a good one. No, I just wanted to give you a quick hard time. But one, one thing that I'm really excited to explore in this conversation is how you've developed your leadership because we've got a lot of listeners a lot of farmers out there that that are inadvertently have to be leaders mm -hmm. yep. whether they're running a small family team on the farm or they're running a larger set of employees that they, they inherently have to be good at a lot of things and one of those is being a leader so uh, would you mind kind of stepping through how your career processed and and what path you took because it wasn't always solely focused on suka no, that's correct. And uh, I've always been known as a little bit of a more quieter individual, but uh, I've always enjoyed interactions with uh, folks. And so uh, when I was in high school, I went down to the Capitol and it was a page in the legislature. And so I always had a little interest in uh, politics. Mm -hmm. And then we went through the, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s were just sort of not tough years out in agriculture. Right. And I got the political bug. And so in 1994, I uh, ran for the legislature and uh, one was in the state house and okay. uh, became a speaker pro tem down to the state house. I was there from 94 to 2002. Okay. And it was one of those things I learned with politics, you know, and especially it's gotten even a lot more divisive now. But 80% of the people just want to make sure that you've listened to them and heard their problem. It's not that that you have to solve it right now or you have to agree with with them, they want to know that their leaders are listening to them. And that's, I think, sort of through we, some of the discourse we've... We've talked about that, message sent, message received, and that that yeah. it's uh, that we know that. But we, we focus on uh, a, a lot of different ways, of course, farm for profit, how to be profitable. Uh, half of profit is communication, working with your team. Um, I'm sure that's what's made your company successful. That's why we have a beautiful booth here is because you've communicated with your people and listened to them. So very yeah, good. You have to take uh, and you have to find those little nuggets that they, they give out uh, uh, through the different... Uh, of conversations and say, okay, this is really what they're concerned with. What can we do uh, right. do better with it? And so that was, you know, I, I enjoyed the politics. You always reach too far. I ran for governor and the loss in a primary by 2%. But, uh, but it was one of those that was where uh, during that time period was just sort of in that, you know, let's go do something phase. And that's where dryers and grain bins uh, right. uh, came about of uh, what we can do as a company to to grow and expand and uh, take care of our customers. Yeah, is it? And that's the the fun thing that we get from our listeners and from getting to talk to people like you is, you still get the ability to form your idea, your own idea, and go your own direction. You can listen and still not have to do what is being said. So, so there's a lot of, of personal development that can go into having confidence in what you're doing. And and, and it excited me when you made the comment earlier about how. You grow, you grew 10x, Dave, mm -hmm. but you did it by expanding product lines 
So what can you maybe shed a little light on how that decision making process went and then we'll try to relate that back to how maybe some of our farmers need to diversify or, or go by introducing more crops uh, rather than just trying to do better at one. Well, we uh, started with the grain dryers, saw a real need that fit into our uh, drying systems and then the grain bins, we had to control our destiny, destiny and so that's where the, the grain bins uh, uh, came about and maybe later on we can talk about the world's largest uh, grain bin uh, we got up Central to Mason Iowa. City. Yes, yeah. yes. Up to Mason City. How big is that? It's a 2.2 million bushel bin. And uh, you can't you know, fit 2.25 in there. Nah. <laughs> I've had, pick it up. I've had, I've had that question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe with some test weight. A good test weight. Good That's right, test yeah. weight. Let's get the test weight debate going. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. That's not well, the time or place. Well, Corey, you know, a, a 747 will fit inside that uh, grain bin. Holy really? cow. Yeah. The, the landing's a little difficult, yeah. but it, it will fit. You get it in, it ain't coming back it ain't out. Coming yeah. back out. Uh -huh. Exactly. That's pretty good. That, Corey, that, that might hold all of your crop from this last year. <laughs> yeah, I'm that good of a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, taking a look at different things, it's amazing, you know, drying crops just gets you all across the country, across the world. I mean, We've uh, dried peanuts for 40 years, been in that market, which then when we went into material handling with the uh, bucket elevators and conveyors, we were working with the peanut industry, the rice industry we've always worked with, whether it was Louisiana, Arkansas, California, and uh, uh, we're doing some more things in California in the nut industry. So there's hmm. just a, a lot of exciting, and it's, but it is amazing how agriculture reaches all phases because with the embargoes and tariffs that they've done the past years even with uh, pistachios uh it it drives everybody nuts nuts so to speak with that <laughs> yep. so was eugene your dad eugene's my dad gotcha yep. so he he started the whole deal did you yep. get any leadership um that you saw in your dad and uh, working the welder oh he was just focused once he started on something uh, he didn't uh he didn't stop so okay. uh not that you know you always tried something. Yeah, I hate, you don't want to call it failure because usually failure, you think of you. You tried it and then you quit and move on. Yeah. He just. It was just the first, the first draft or the second draft or the third item. I mean, he just kept working away at it till uh, he got it, and uh, you know he cared and listened to the customers. So okay. that was well, that was always one of the things that you come back through. Well, maybe something didn't work out the best, but we're going to make sure it works for you eventually. And uh, so yeah, he was just passionate about the industry and uh, uh every you know that shows that people go well i talked to your dad you know here you know 12 yeah. years ago or yeah. something or yeah. 20 years ago and yeah, anyway so there'll always be a eugene story uh, floating around uh -huh. so Corey's fifth generation farmer and it's fun to see how sukup has remained family business family. generational yeah. so there's clearly from the beginning that characteristic that that drive to make family work what advice do you have to someone running a family business or a family farm that has allowed you guys to successfully do this and continue to involve more generations? Because your daughter's also involved. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my son's here today. And uh, so we've got five of the third generation working in the plant. Uh, I've got uh, five grandkids. And so fourth generations come through and do a little bit of paper recycling or uh, <laughs> delivering we, mail ma mail and yep. uh i've got uh grandson uh, he's he's gotten a welding helmet already for christmas awesome. and so, <laughs> yes so, so we'll see about uh, getting that pulled out sometime but uh, i think it's just being you know patience and being able to to work with work with each other and uh you know sometimes it's set up better than others so it's uh we got the opportunity to interview some of your employees, and we asked that question, like, how, how have you been with the company so long? Family-owned, good people. How many employees does Sukup have now? Uh, we're I, right. I asked that. Let's see if I was right. Somebody told me there was 700. 700. Is there yeah. right. yeah, wow. so 700 employees, and uh, we've got about 10 different state locations and a couple, two international locations as well. Probably hiring all the time. We're trying. Yes, yeah. we're trying. It's hard to do right now. Wow. Yeah, it is. It's a tight, that's, tight market. That's but, a good uh, point, Corey. So how, how clearly you've done it successfully because I haven't heard of there been any issues with with how Sukup has made it through COVID. But but do you have anything that sticks out with how your leadership team worked through the pandemic to, to keep it all together and the, the morale up? 
Yeah, and as you think back, you know, two years ago when it came up about exactly this time, it was one of those, everybody was dealing with so much unknown and just having, you know, some good facts to be able to base it on. So, you know, we went through all the quarantines or somebody got exposed, we would, uh, you know, yeah. shut down the department, which sort of was a tough, tough one to, uh -huh. to, to do all the time. But uh uh, and going through it, we might we might have had like up until this last variant that sort of just sort of flowed mm -hmm. through. But yeah. uh, before that, uh, maybe about 40 people that had COVID. But I think there's only like two of them that we could really track back that the contract tracing really would have led back to the with the work environment. Well, so that's we good. we had good separation. And uh, one of the things family members, one of the things Emily and our HR Samantha had worked on was we have a clinic on site at Suka. Oh, okay. So instead of somebody having to spend a half a day going back and forth to the doctor's office in Mason City and waiting, waiting, we've got a clinic right in sight. And it was one of those I was I was skeptical about it, but sure. it, but it was one of those that Emily says, yeah, I think we need to to do that and so you just go okay and just you know let them trust, let them trust yep. and, and let it work it and uh work it and learn and that's that's the thing and uh uh whether it's like with all our electronic controls uh, that's what matt uh third generation uh works on all the electrical controls with you know the paddle sweeps and the dryers and just really making connectivity uh important to it Tanner, we, we did a podcast a while back. Uh, uh, we've kind of alluded to the to the history of Sukup. Um, we haven't gone into the future of Sukup yet, but uh, Steve, do you see a, a new need? Uh, I mean, you, you've came 10X. Is it go horizontal at this time, or is there new needs out there that you're seeing? We believe for the manufacturing and the grain bins and stuff, we've got a pretty good feel on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the areas, I mean, every, every bit of our customers grain every kernel goes through our our equipment so that's where we're working on and you know tackling how can we add value of knowing everything about that kernel whether it's the the oils or the starches you know test weights and everything of how can we give better information back to whether you know whether it's for the ethanol industry or or other aspects What's to my it adage? Is the juice worth the squeeze? Not that one. <laughs> I'm setting you up. <laughs> data is the currency of the future, and yeah. data is the and currency the of the internet. Yeah. Yes. Well, you're, you're yeah. nailing it. I see every business, and, and it's funny because a lot of people think agriculture, that we're a bunch of dumb farmers in, in coveralls, but there is so much technology and innovation sitting right in front of us right now. It is, it is amazing to me. Um, I'm glad you're capturing that because it, it will be uh, crucial in the future, I'm sure. No, we've... Uh yeah, you know, our whole whole group is uh, concentrating on that of what we can do next for our customers and uh, you know keep them profitable and and we I mean ag is you know it's fundamental it's part of the uh, I call it the you know the the pyramid of economics you got to either be building something or growing something and so being in the ag industry as a manufacturer is perfect and we do some farming on the side and so we we live it we breathe it we understand it and. Uh, you know, when they take in an extra 9,000 bushels and say, hey, I just delivered some to the elevator, uh, right. you like hearing that. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we've also learned in the time that we got to spend down here that when you're talking about the future of the company, you've done some really great things as Sukup with some key employees that are, are making some help, really helping make strategic moves and decisions to position the business today to handle the future. But it also kind of helped, it sounds like, through any challenges that you've faced so far because you're doing a very good job of maintaining your supply yes. currently even though we're, we're seeing shortages around all industries so could you tell a little bit more about how you guys went about trying to secure and, and maintain that process well one of the uh, keys is uh, having good relationships with all the vendors and so that's one of the the items uh, We've been famous that, you know, the checks had to be signed, uh, you know, it was my dad and then it was my brother and I, and now it's myself. Uh, we've, we've done a little bit of automation that way, but we know every vendor out uh -huh. there, mm -hmm. you know, and even uh, competitors. I was at a steel conference yesterday and uh, one of our uh, Balin uh, individual, I see is on the panel. And so I was going to catch up with him, but he caught up with me first to say, hey, Steve, you know, and, uh, you know, they had some tragedy in their business, one of the... Uh, uh, family members uh, pass quickly and so just that you know it's 
nice in the industry being uh, friendly competitors uh, at some point uh, along the way. But uh, we have had some opportunities. Uh, you know, we've got thir strong third generation uh, in the business, uh, five of them working hard, uh, you know, whether it's uh, general counsel, electronics, engineering, uh, produ production manufacturing uh -huh. uh, uh, with things. And then we have uh, uh, brought in a couple other individuals uh, that have extensive uh, experience with uh, John Deere and looking at other expertises out there yeah. that's not necessarily my strength. So you start looking at, uh, you know, where is that next niche market that we yep. need to, to go to. So uh, Absolutely. That's what and, we've got going on. Neither, neither one of us are an expert in everything, and we've all got our own little, well, little, Tanner, little spot. They're, they're, of course, brilliant in marketing because they've already moved to podcasts, and everybody uh -huh. knows that, that, <laughs> that everybody has a podcast. So, of course, they're very yeah. forward-thinking. They're going to grow 10x again. But, yeah. yes. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll give you the report next year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll see if we're back here next year, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious on not on the ag side of things, but you are a major major supporter of a team that's uh, deeply close in our hearts. I'm a graduate of Iowa State University, and there's souk up all over the end zone everywhere at Iowa State. I love it. Where does that tie come from? Oh, well, it comes back to uh, my brother went down to Iowa State, and then I went to Iowa State. Uh, enjoyed the engineering aspect, and you know, strong agriculture, and I'm sure it was close. So, yeah. folks thought that was a, a good idea, but uh, it had the right major. I mentioned before, love the the metal fabrication aspect, and then one of the things, yeah, you know, it has at the uh, stadium. We've got the Suka Bin Zone uh, Club, and uh, inside it. They said we could basically uh, do the interior, and so it yep. looks like grain bins inside yeah. uh, with the, the different uh, uh, areas, and then there's tons of perforated metal in there, and we put our logo in every other piece of uh, uh, perforated metal, and during the opening, grandson was down there, and I don't know, you know, four years old or so, and he looked at the perforated metal with the Iowa State on it, and then he looked at the one with our logo on it, and he says, Iowa State, work. Iowa State, work. <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids have seen that. We have tickets in the Sukaben zone, and uh, we were on the 50-yard line, but we didn't like it as much because when it rains, we can't go inside with our kids. So if you have kids, it works really good to be in that uh, interior uh, when it's cold on it game day, I can tell you that. Yeah, and, it, and it's fun uh, being with quality organizations. I mean, when you got Jamie Pollard and, you know, the, the coaches that he's put together with Matt Campbell and TJ and just the whole crew, the Bills, the Finleys, and uh, you know just up and down the the league. You know yeah. Jamie's yeah. focus, making sure it's right. But uh, again, for an organization, sometimes you have to know that there's one person that's going to give you an answer. And yeah. you know, if it's in athletics, you know it's going to be Jamie or you know. We had so. the pleasure to have Jamie on the podcast yeah. uh, almost two years ago now. And he is so well spoken, so so forward thinking, and he's just so aware. Yeah, he, he's aware of of what it takes to be successful in an environment, a certain environment, because you can be successful in a different city, in a different town, in a different college, and still be a great coach. But we had to find a fit, and I'm sure that's some of the same type of things that you do at Sukup. Yeah, you got a lot of family base to work off of, but it it takes more than just family to make it work. Yeah, and that's where you know course we, we enjoy going down and recruiting at Iowa State but then I uh, I think last week we had some folks down to Iowa City uh, doing some yeah what? doing some recruiting <laughs> and uh, yeah the tagline was uh, Steve Sukup says never say never yeah, there, so. you go. there you go that's smart <laughs> you must have a good marketing department too <laughs> we count on them a lot yeah. Yeah, there you go. well you and you've so you've built your business and it's not always been focused on uh, just just money or growing or or the time you guys actually we've we've seen some of your uh, uh, grain bins that actually are go overseas for housing too which is kind of neat yeah no that was and that came about uh back in 2010 and it's again you know i was out on the plant floor and our uh our safety engineer had always wanted to build a grain bin house okay and you know i, I like building grain bins but i'm not quite there and uh, living in one but he always thought that would be pretty cool and um, he had sort of worked with my dad a little bit but my dad was a little skeptical and just didn't quite happen and then the earthquake down in Haiti yep. happened 
you know, eight, 10,000 people killed in concrete structures. You saw these blue tarp cities immediately pop up and I was out on the plant floor and he came up to me and said, hey, I want to build this emergency uh, shelter home. I think we can make one out of a grain bin. I go, okay, as long as it's an 18 footer, which is the smallest standard one we have. And then uh, there's an email that he's you know, followed up on with, I I'm, I'm, want to think about that. What do you want for a proposal? And I said, three words, build a prototype. And that's, you know, just go do it and let's see what see what happens. And uh, it's, it's a game changer for families, whether it's in Haiti or that's Peru awesome. or right. Uganda. So it, 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 it does make a difference. And so it feels, feels good to use some of your expertise in other areas that can can help others. I got about 10 government bins that you guys can take and send down there. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got the Butler special. They don't blow down in derechos, unfortunately. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> the steel must be like, I don't know, a quarter inch thick or something. We had one of the safety homes assembled. I actually got to help put it together yep. at the Farm for Profit conference. Oh, gosh, that's been three years ago now. At least, yeah. Um, some, some assembly required. Yes, yeah. there was some <laughs> assembly, yes. Uh, but we, we think it would be super cool if we could get and figure out a way to get a podcast studio inside of one. So <laughs> that's, cool. that's our what? next our next conversation. Yeah. But but it yeah. was it was fascinating to see how much shelter and how safe they can be inside of it and the designs that you guys have come up with to make sure that they're hurricane-proof. They're not really resistant. It's basically proof. Yeah. No, one of the last hurricanes, the eye of the storm came over Lakai down in uh, Haiti, and that's where, uh, well, son Nick, he's been down there like 10 times. Luke's been down to Haiti putting up safety homes, great mission mission trips, but uh, they had 55 people, 55 people in one of these uh, safety homes, 150 mile, mile an hour winds, and everybody came out fine. Did you hear that? 55 people, Dave. That's a lot of people inside of a Well, it's probably multiple. Bin bins, right? Or was it in one? No, in one. In one. Wow. one. One was report and everybody came out safe because huh. everything else was getting blown away. Wow. Well, so Tanner, what I heard was three words, build a prototype. So what that said to me was trust, trust, trust in the people. So when we were talking about how are we successful, uh, it sounds to me like hire good people and know that they're going to do a good job and, and trust them to do their own thing. And I, I think farmers, well, uh, dad, let's say dads, <laughs> maybe don't trust their kids when they come back from school. We've had this conversation, Corey. You, well, we know more than them. We know more than them, of course. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe the good leadership portion is uh, uh, just trusting. Yeah, I, I would agree. And and it's fun to have had the conversations that we've had the pleasure of having on this podcast to learn how even though there's a lot of different leadership styles, there's still some really core core bases to what drives the trust and respect that you get and give both directions. But what I want to know is someone who's leading a successful company that's growing, uh, you know, people would think that you don't have to worry a lot, but I want to know what keeps you up at night. What What's on Steve's mind that, that has the concern that you want to address? Well, I mean, this year has been quite the year with the supply chain. We felt probably the most confident in that, actually, because uh, we had good relationships with our vendors mm -hmm. and uh, good supply. All the steel that you see here on our booth comes from U.S. steel mills. Of the four largest steel mills I visited with each of the presidents over the last mm -hmm couple of years that we stay connected that we're going to keep our supply coming uh, the steel prices did go up 250 oh percent so my, that was wow. one that that one sort of kept you up or you you right. thought of that when you rolled that's over. hard not to think about yeah so when you're you know 60 percent of your input costs have more than doubled uh, uh, that's a, that's a tough one yep uh, but no it's it is the next next phase that we can go to like I say I I feel good. I can go out in the plant and you can sense whether things are working right or not or products flowing through it. But it's the new areas of uh, how are we going to help with our, our, the grains, the kernels of each of our customers. Uh, what, how can we help them add value to keep them growing and expanding? And, you know, we got a world population that keeps growing. Okay. So uh, feeding the world is still a, we enjoy it and think it's a very valuable portion to do. If I can put your mind at ease on that it's the sticker shock <laughs> of a new grain bin it, 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 it's real 
But John said it best yesterday. I think we were talking. He's like, so what? It takes three years now instead of one to, to pay it off. It's still one of the best. <laughs> it's still one of the best investments in, in farming. You know, tile and grain bins. Yep. You know, is one of the best. You know, and <laughs> okay, and, tile. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it pays back the fastest. And you know, if you would have actually not taken your beans to market last fall and waited, and you'd have paid for the bin right now. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. Store you, and ignore. You think last. Store Cor- and ignore. Cor- I, Corey, I think you're hired. <laughs> yeah. buy, buy, buy land and wait. Don't wait to buy land. Yeah. yeah there we well, go. last April, May, you just didn't see how the markets were going to move. Yeah. I mean, there, you just didn't see any factors out there to, to move. And now uh, everybody that had uh, corn in the their grain bin doubled their doubled their prices. Yep. So uh, that we do really honestly believe it is the piece of equipment on the farm that can make your money year in and year out. So uh, us on the podcast, we're always trying to improve, be better, um, take advice from everybody. And I know our listeners are too, because that's why they're listening. Um, it's, we, we have a section called What's Working in Ag? Uh, just what is working? To all of our listeners, it's coffee shop talk. Nobody ever tells you the real deal until we get to the coffee shop, right? Well, what, what piece of advice do you have? What's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten or, or the best piece of advice you'd give? Well, I guess uh, never say never. Always be willing to, to try something. Uh, like I say, I, I don't try and uh, out, uh, think, out think things. You have okay. to go with, does it make sen- sense, you know, the first test? And then if not, you know, go build a prototype. Let's, let's try it. That's great. Now, we also have a question that we ask every one of our guests before we close out. But I don't want to cut these guys off early if you have something else that you wanted to go down a rabbit hole i I got one more so i'm always curious with any kind of uh, leader um well uh, two questions tanner i got two (laughs) so we went for governor and i'm thinking that never say never so president uh next year (laughs) there there are some things that you get cured (laughs) (laughs) i I was just gonna go that direction i figured and the, the next question i have it's a little simpler um and your guys might be able to answer it better than you do you have a pet peeve Oh, oh that's, that's a great that question. That is. I, that didn't get any. Uh, he- I do. I do. <laughs> we, got the, we got some of the uh, peanut gallery out yeah. saying, I got the answer for they that. Could, yeah, they that. could probably help that out a little bit. Long emails. Okay, <laughs> long, long emails. emails. Keep, keep it short and to the point. I like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, I do have a couple of good ones. I got to think on that, though. So, anyway. <laughs> John, what, what is what? it? Oh, oh you, John. you are the pet peeve? Oh, John's oh, the, John's pet, the peeve. pet peeve. Okay. <laughs> You're still here, though. That's right. Just can't get rid of you. Well, I like your short emails. Elon Musk, uh, he said once, I, one of his quotes was, if, if you don't need my participation in a meeting in the first 10 minutes, then I'm leaving because you don't need me there. <laughs> I was like, you guys can figure it out yourself then if I'm not, if I'm not part of the meeting. So, yeah, I like that. So the, the payoff question that we ask every one of our guests, and we'll give you a chance to think about it, All right. is what do you know now? that you wish you'd have known sooner? It's just a general question that we've asked. So what do you know now that you wish you'd have known sooner? But listeners, we're down here at the National Farm Machinery Show having a conversation with Steve Sukup. And we have had the pleasure of being in the Sukup Manufacturing booth down here. Just a little quick refresher that Steve's dad, Eugene, started this company to try and provide a solution to making sure grain stayed in condition. Got a patent for the Stirway stirring machine and then continued to grow that business since 1963 and expand that into a full line of grain handling products. They saw a need. They did. Nearly 60 years of having, or almost, yeah, a little bit, all we're pretty close to 60 years of running a family-owned grain bin industry business. Dad served as president for 32 years, and then Steve's brother, Charles, correct, for a period of time, and now Steve, stepping in here to keep it continue to be family run uh, taking a significant step to begin working on grain bins yourselves to manufacturing themselves to help control more of the process and keep the quality uh, in its place but a really fun conversation that we've had it's been our pleasure to have you on steve and that was a professional stall in case you needed help <laughs> not very professional oh, oh ouch. <laughs> it's a rough crowd for the morning <laughs> rough crowd so if you had to do something again, or, or if, if you had to know something again, what do you know now that you wish you would have known before? Probably uh, centers around a little bit. I, I enjoyed going out and doing the politics, and you know that was something that you, you know, put your name out there, and either people could like or, or differentiate it. 
uh, which I did enjoy the politics, but I might have done some things different in the business, just saying, you know, I can put my name out there and do it and what needs to happen uh, now. And so uh, I would have uh, probably taken a little step back and seen what we could have done some differently in the business uh, before that. Maybe add some more perspective is what perspective. it sounds like. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's great. We get all different answers on this. The last person we asked said they'd have more kids. Is that one of your answers? Everybody's got a different... Three is a perfect number, three as, far is as, the I'm, perfect yeah, number as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I get, yeah, we went from uh, two, which I called man to man, and then when we had the third, you had to go to zone. Go to zone. So, there yeah. you, had, you had to go to zone. <laughs> yep. Got the Iowa State Athletics thrown right there at the end of this. But no, it's been our pleasure to have you on. We appreciate you having us down here with Suk up at the National Farm Machinery Show. Uh, we look forward to hopefully doing it again and continuing to partner. But listeners, if you've got any topics, ideas, or suggestions for us, farmforprofitllc at gmail.com. Don't be afraid to find us on social media. Check us out. Leave us a review. Extend a like. And make sure to go to Sukup Manufacturing. Give them a like, a rate, a review. And yeah. if you haven't looked at their product, make sure to go look at their product. Um, they have. You need to talk with a salesman because uh, I've learned a ton just talking with a salesman. What I thought I knew, I didn't know. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's great. Sukup.com. Sukup.com. And you can find all of it. And thanks again, Steve. We appreciate your time. And listeners, until next time, have a good one. Thank you. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long.